If you will turn with me to the Gospel of John, we come to John chapter 1. And we're going to read from 35 to 51 as we continue our series through a harmony of the gospel accounts. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. This is the word of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. And this is the word of God. And one of the challenges, and I've said this before, but one of the challenges in writing a sermon is to determine what it is the word of God is intending to say here, why is it that the author of the gospel included this particular story? I mean, John will say that there are so many other things that Jesus did that are not written here. So why did John decide, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, but but why did John desire to include this story here? We might read this story and be tempted to think that this is a story about sharing with others about Jesus. Here we've got John the Baptist, who has pointed Andrew and an unnamed disciple, most likely this is actually John himself, but pointing them to Jesus. Andrew then goes and he gets Peter, and then we have Philip who goes and gets Nathaniel. And so we may read this and say, well, obviously, this is what this is about. This is a story about telling other people about Jesus, that we too ought to go to our friends and, and like Philip said to Nathaniel, say, come and see. Now, I recall back in seminary that one of the chapel services that I attended, that was exactly the message that was preached. We had a, one of our guest preachers come in and he, he preached from this passage and his sermon was focused on Andrew going and telling Peter. And he said, here is an example for all of us that we ought to go likewise and tell others about Jesus. And and maybe you're somebody who doesn't feel like you have much to contribute to the kingdom. You don't feel like you're the, uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer. And so you kind of downplay how God could possibly use you for the kingdom. Well, there is something you can do. You can say, come and see. And who knows? 
It may be that one of those people that hears what you have to say, who does come and see, they place faith in Jesus, and they could be someone like Peter, someone who is used mightily by the Lord. Because as we read the Gospels, we don't hear much about Andrew moving forward. But we know Peter. Peter becomes one of those in Jesus' inner circle. He is one that has goes to the transfiguration. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. He's one of the great preachers of the gospel in the book of Acts. And so again, the lesson may be that you don't feel that you've got much to offer to the kingdom, but you can say, come and see. And perhaps the one who does will be used in great ways for the kingdom. Now, since that day, I've read many who have used this passage in the same way. I've heard many who have used this passage in the same way. And as I was preparing this week and I'm reading it, it just was not satisfying to me. I mean, this was one of those passages that you just wrestle with and say, why is this here? And I, and, I, and while that, that may be a good secondary application, that we should, of course, go and tell our friends, come and see. It just didn't feel like this is why John included this. And what I found helpful was going back to read what John said his reason for writing his gospel was. We find in chapter 20 where John says that there were so many other things that Jesus said that I haven't included them all in here. But he says, the things that I did write, I included here so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So here John is, and he's saying, I'll tell you why I wrote the things I wrote. I wrote in order that you might believe. That John's main concern was not lessons on what we should do, but rather a presentation of the one in whom we should believe. The stories that he does share serve those ends. Why should we believe that Jesus is the one? And as soon as you get that in your head, and say, this is what John is after, this is why he's writing this, things begin to click. Because what you see now, or what you ask of yourself, what, what is here that strengthens John's contention that this is indeed the Son of God, that this is the Messiah, this is the one in whom you ought to believe. And what we see is that John is beginning here to put a list together of witnesses. He's telling the story of how they came to believe in Christ in order that we might find their testimony compelling. You know, it's not uncommon to hear among skeptics for them to point to, you know, the, 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 the disciples of Jesus, they really came from a primary blue collar crowd. They weren't the elites. They weren't the scholars. They weren't the highly educated. Many of them were, they were fishermen that were uh, working on their nets when Jesus just came out of the blue and called them to follow him. And, and they used this as material to kind of buttress their own personal doubts. Because they say, well, not only were they not scholarly, but, but, but Jesus kind of came up out of the blue and just said to them, hey, follow me. And, you know, that could be an effective method to draw people under your sway and under your control. You, know, you, you, you go to somebody unassuming, somebody especially perhaps that's in an oppressive situation like they were. That they, they really don't have any, any hope. Perhaps they're, they're, they're looking for escape. And, and you come up to them out of the blue and you start filling them with some empty hopes. Hope against hope. You guarantee that you've got something to offer. That perhaps you've got the way out. That you are somebody of strength and character that can lead them out of the oppression they're in. And, and, and I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll find some who will buy into this. Some who will follow you. And, and if you get them with you long enough, eventually they'll start almost deifying you. In fact, 
maybe even calling you the Messiah. They say, isn't this what happened here? Isn't that what happened in these days? There were a number of revolutionaries who who rose up and who began to make promises to the people and they began to follow them in such a way as this. And this is no different, just another story, another story that we see sometimes happening in today's world. It's not that hard to find some followers. But then what John is doing is he's, he's saying, he's pointing this out, he's saying, is this what happened? Is that really what happened? When Jesus raised up these followers that he was some sort of revolutionary that came out of anywhere and was instilling false hopes to a naive group of unsuspecting bystanders? Is that what happened? And John's saying, not at all. John's helping us to understand what it was that really happened. Now, how how, how so? How how is he doing that? Well, we notice here that those who were first introduced to Jesus were first disciples of John. We see that in verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, one of those was Andrew, Peter's brother. The other one was unnamed. And again, I believe it was most likely John, the author of the gospel himself. And you say, well, well, so what? Well, this means that they, as disciples, had been listening to John preach. They had heard him reiterate the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. He's put himself forward as being the herald that was prophesied about, who who was coming to to lay the groundwork, to to make the way straight for this coming Messiah, to, to announce the beginning of the public ministry of this Messiah. And they've heard him say this, and they've weighed this, and they have concluded that he was indeed the fulfillment of these prophecies. And so then what does John do? John points away from himself and to Jesus. And what we see, John, here is he's handing off his disciples to Jesus, that they might be his disciples. And and here we have the Old Testament prophet pointing them to the fulfillment of the prophecy. What we're watching is the shadow giving way to reality, the weight of is over. And we see this in Jesus' conversation with Nathanael. When Jesus says in, in verse 47, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, uh, this is not simply a comment on how Nathanael is speaking honestly and forthrightly when he asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, how, how can I know that? Well, because of what Jesus says next to him. In verse 51, You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, what's that a reference to? It's a reference to Genesis 28, right? Of Jacob's dream of the heavens being opened up and the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder to heaven. Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. 
And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So this is the dream of Jacob. And do you know what Jacob's name means? Jacob's name means heel grabber or supplanter. And it speaks not only about the manner of his birth, but it speaks of his deceitful ways as an adult. Now, it's later when Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord that his name is changed to Israel. And so when Jesus says to Nathanael, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. This is a play on words. Here he is comparing Nathanael to Jacob. And then he says, in essence, what Jacob saw in shadowy form in a dream, you will witness the reality in me. So again, what's happening is that the Old Testament promises are giving way to the fulfillment in the New Testament In Christ, these disciples are moving on from hearing promises to witnessing fulfillment. And this is what John's disciples have been waiting on. They have been anticipating the fulfillment of these promises. And so you can tell by by watching the scene and hearing from what they say that they were not just some fishermen who had not given any of this any thought They were disciples of John who knew the word. And you listen to what they said. We we have found the Messiah. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. They knew who it was that they were waiting on. And so here we have in this story, we have John the Baptist, the prophet John the Baptist, giving his commendation of Christ. Then we see that these disciples of John, they now begin to spend time with Jesus, time to watch Jesus, time to listen to him. We even are shown some healthy skepticism on the part of Nathaniel. And again, the the impression that's given here is that these are not just some folks that are taken off guard and are swept up in their naivete and following some revolutionary that has fooled them and pulled the wool over their eyes. Something is transpiring here. These are men who have given this some thought, and there is something that has transpired here that has lent Jesus credibility in their eyes. They've heard, they've watched, they've reflected on prophecy, and they've concluded this is the one. And John's message to you is, and so should you. This is John's message to his readers. That is the message today. Christianity is not a religion of mindless so-called blind faith. Christianity has been examined. It has been tested. It has been tried. It is, as John would let, later say in his letter we call 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-3, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. John is saying what we're reading here are not just made up fairy tales. The men who tell these stories were not fools. 
This is John's message. Believe. Go ahead and consider some of the details in this story that may help us to appreciate it a bit more. And first of all, I will point out something that I've, I've pointed out in my basic Christianity Sunday school class. And, and it has to do with the way that our Bibles are commonly put together. And I'm going to assume yours is like mine. But when I, I come to verse 35 in John chapter 1, above it, between verse 34 and verse 35 is there, this heading. It says, Jesus calls the first disciples. Now, does yours have the same thing? I think most of ours does, right? Now, I want to make sure that you understand that's not part of the Word of God. That's not part of the inspired text of Scripture. That was put there by some editor who's trying to make the Bible easier for you to use. He organizes it for us. So we might be able to find things quicker. And they do that in order for it to be helpful to us. And sometimes it is helpful, and sometimes it's not all that helpful. And this is actually one of those times in which it's not all that helpful. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 5, down the wrong chapter. Chapter 4, sorry. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Above verse 18. What's it say? Jesus calls the first disciples. Does yours say that? Mine says that. Now in the verses that follow is a telling of a scene that is completely different than the one we just read. read. Here they are casting their nets in the sea and them mending their nets. And, and where this causes a problem is, is if I'm reading this title here, it says Jesus calls the first disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And then I flip over to John 1, verse 35, it says Jesus calls the first disciples. And I'm assuming that the story that follows are the same story, but they're not the same story. And what I do then is I scratch my head and I say, well, wait a minute. It seems to be some sort of conflict in the word of God. Now, how, how do I make these two stories jive? And they, and they really don't jive together. So then it makes me go, well, wait a minute. Does, has Matthew gotten something wrong or has, has John got something wrong? And now that's beginning to undermine my confidence in the, the authority of the word of God. But understand, again, these, these titles are not the inspired word of text. They're, they're just there to, as, as helps. But sometimes they're not helpful. These two stories do fit with one another, but they're not the same story. What we're reading in John 1 actually happens before what we read in Matthew 4. In John 1, we have Jesus coming by and John the Baptist pointing the disciples to Jesus and saying, there's the Lamb of God. And they, they begin walking with him and they're listening to him. They're observing him. But when the day's done, they, they go back home. They go back to their, their day. Now, they're going to rejoin him like we're going to find them do at the wedding of Cana. They're going to hang out with Jesus on occasion. But this is before Jesus calls them to the full-time gig of being disciples of Jesus, which is what we find in Matthew 4. So I, I bring all this up just to, to make sure that we understand that. And understand that sometimes what we read in the scriptures that seem to be apparent difficulties really are not difficulties at all, but are man-made troubles. But there is something that is interesting here. That there, there's this gap between John 1 and him walking with the disciples and Matthew 4 when he finally calls them to follow him officially. It just gives us a picture of, of Jesus and the way he works with his people, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus doesn't come in storming in, demanding allegiance. He says to them, what are you looking for? And he says, well, why don't you come see? Jesus is not afraid of being inspected. They join him at the wedding in Cana, and they're watching 
and they're listening. In the same way, he calls to you. Come see. And he gives you opportunity to listen to him and watch him in his word. And not just to read stories about him and reading about the things he said in, in times past, but this is the word of God. It is living and active. It will speak and it will reveal. It will enlighten. It will pierce your soul. And so I encourage you to ask yourselves, Lord, give me eyes to see that I may, like your disciples before me, be able to, to observe and, and, and weigh the evidence. Are, are you the Savior or not? Jesus says, well, what is it you seek? And, and they respond, Rabbi, which means teacher. They long to be taught. And the question I want to pose to you is, do you? Or have you made up your mind before you give Christ a listen? My point is, you, you can go to the word as a skeptic. You can say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's fine. But let Jesus reveal himself to you. The one thing you can't do is let him pass by. The disciples didn't. And you mustn't. Behold him in his word. Hear what it is he says. And as we behold, the way in which he communicates with the disciples, we, we look at his patience. I mean, Jesus says to, to who he will call Peter, you, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. When does it happen? When does he change his name to Peter? Well, Matthew records it for us, and it's not until Matthew 16, right before the transfiguration. And what I want to know here is that, that Jesus, with his disciples, is, is, as they say, he plays the long game. He's acting now with future results in mind. And, and so Peter will be, Simon will be called Peter, but it's not for some time down the road. And in other words, Jesus calls him to be his disciple, but it's going to be a journey. And it's going to be a journey of discovery. A slow journey of, of learning and growth before Peter gets to the point of confidently asserting that he not only knows about the Messiah, but that he indeed knows the Messiah. And this is true of the disciples of Jesus, all of us. He plays the long game with us. And when we begin our walk with Christ, we don't always start rock solid in our faith. Sometimes it takes time. It takes a process. And so we're patient. And we're patient with others. Someone may confess Christ, and just because we don't see some immediate pronounced change in them doesn't mean that Jesus is not working. And that Jesus does not have a big plan for them. But again, what, what's John showing us? Jesus knew Peter before Peter knew himself. Why should we believe that Jesus is the Christ? And John says, in essence, come see. Read and see this one. Hear the word and, and recognize that Jesus knows you too. His word will reveal to you what you don't know about yourself. And when it does, the call is, now turn your eyes to Christ and believe. And then we've got Jesus' declaration to Nathaniel. And we recognize that when, when, when Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth, that shouldn't necessarily be seen of him as him being snarky, right? Because Jesus says that here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So Jesus is not 
offended by what Nathaniel says there. Maybe it's just simply Nathaniel being honest. He, he knows, again, who it is he's looking for. He's, he's waiting on the Messiah. And in his mind, this Messiah who's going to come as a savior, as king, as deliverer, Nazareth? Really? Shouldn't he be in Rome? Shouldn't he be at least be in Jerusalem? So maybe it's just an honest observation on Nathaniel's part. That someone who wants to know for sure, is this the one? And again, it's Jesus' response, though, that is of most, uh, most interest to us. Jesus responds by speaking of himself as the son of man. And this is one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. And you know where they came from? It comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Where Daniel had a vision, verses 13 and 14. Daniel writes, I I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And by using this title, Jesus is declaring that one that Daniel saw is me. And so when you encounter someone that says, you know, Jesus never described himself as being any more than a teacher. You know, nowhere in the Bible can you point to me that Jesus declared of himself to be divine. Well, take him here. Take them here to John chapter 1 and then direct them back to Daniel and say, then what is it that he is saying? And why is it that the Jews wanted to kill him for blasphemy? Because he said it. But then here we've got his use of Jacob's vision. He says that it likewise is a a reference to him. In the vision, we have angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And and Jacob declares, this is the gate of heaven. And Jesus declares himself the son of man and says that Nathanael will see angels and descending upon him. What is he saying of himself? He is saying, I am the gateway to heaven. If you are to enter into heaven, you must ascend by way of me. He tells Nathanael, you will see the heavens opened. Well, when did Nathanael see that? Well, there are only two times in the gospel accounts that the heavens were opened, and Nathanael wasn't there for either of them. One was at the baptism of Jesus, and one of them was at the transfiguration. So it's better to be understood that Jesus was not saying that Nathaniel would look up in the sky and he'd see the clouds part, but that what he was saying is that if you will watch me, if you will listen to me in my ministry, you will see through faith that heaven is opened up to you. I have reached down from heaven, coming as one born of a woman, and yet I reach into heaven as the eternal son of man. Believe upon me and I will be the gateway to heaven for you. And in this way, the heavens remain open even today to those who would believe upon this Christ. John says, I write these things in order that you might believe. There are not many ladders to heaven, but just the one. And his name is Jesus. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life in view of those who were looking for the coming Messiah. He was questioned. He was tested. He was watched by those who had every reason to deny what they saw because persecution is coming. And that persecution is going to cost some of them their very lives. 
They could have avoided that persecution by denying him, but they said, we cannot deny what it is that we saw. He was and is the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come to die for the sins of the world, that all those who would believe upon him might live and find him to be the gateway to heaven. And so John says, Believe. And he says to those who do, you have every reason to. Let's pray.